Okay, so let's start with bladder health. We're gonna go over a little bit of bowel and bladder, um, some symptom management, urinary urgency, and talk a little bit about urinary and fecal incontinence. I broke it down in the sense of I'll go over bladder and all of the below, and then I'll go over bowel at the end. So first off, bladder health. Uh, if you guys look at the picture to the right, it is the one that Q had brought up earlier um, last week in regards to bladder filling. So healthy bladder function, um, it comes in three phases. So there's a storage phase where the bladder muscle, which is called the detrusor, is actually relaxed. It relaxes so it can fill. And the pelvic floor muscles, where people will talk about their kegels, those are actually semi-contracted to prevent leakage. So I tell people, think about what happens to a water balloon as we fill it with water. The balloon itself has to learn how to stretch in order to fill it at its capacity. And your pelvic floor is essentially the hand that's holding the balloon. As it um, gets heavier with fluid, the hand actually has to isometrically hold it up, but not really grip, because we all know if you grip it, it'll pop. Um, so the transition phase is the filling phase. You actually have three signals, essentially. You could have more, but essentially we break it down into three different signals. First signal you get is essentially what we call the first sensation to void. You have about five to seven ounces in the bladder and it's just kind of the bladder telling you, hey, think about it. Uh, if you are doing something or busy, don't have a restroom, don't need to go, then we kind of delay. And when that happens, you know, some time goes by, whether it's five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour or two, uh, you get a desire to void. That is our second knock on the door, if you will. You get about six to 10 ounces in the bladder at that point. And again, that's just the bladder telling the brain, hey, think about it, I'm getting heavy. I'm kind of filling. Where is the restroom maybe in the next half hour, 20 minutes? Um, we make those decisions in a north, normal healthy situation where we go, okay, well, it's 10 minutes till home, there's no traffic, I can just wait. Um, last signal, the third signal is that strong desire to void. So it's anywhere from 11 to 18 ounces. These numbers are slightly arbitrary. However, thinking about that one time you're in the restroom line, you're fine at the end of the line and you wait, you wait, you get to the front of the line and all of a sudden it's kind of there. You kind of need to have the, what we call the pee dance, the wiggle, the wobble, and kind of waddle your way to the restroom. So those are your three signals that the um, bladder gives the brain. And the last phase is emptying. You get into the restroom and you shut the door, you pull your pants down. When we sit down to void, your bladder is actually contracting. It's actually a reverse roll. The bladder contracts to squeeze out all the urine and your pelvic floor actually is supposed to relax to allow the emptying. It kind of goes back to um, what Q, well, it's going to go back to what Q will talk about next week in regards to pushing. So bladder habits. So the do's and the don'ts of bladder. So what you want to do, you want to maintain good fluid intake throughout the day. You don't want to front load. So a lot of people will think about, okay, well, if I need 60 ounces in a day, then I will have 60 ounces at 8 a.m or between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. and then nothing for the rest of the day. Um, the, what we're, con we're consistently filling and uh, metabolizing, so making sure that you are very hydrated throughout the day is very important. Um, limiting your bladder irritants. So bladder irritants, uh, some common ones are high caffeine intake, high alcohol intake, um, citrus, spicy foods. These are just things that irritate the bladder lining. And when it's in the bladder, the bladder just kind of goes, mm, don't like it, get it out. And that's how we get a lot more frequency, urgency, and things like that. Um, avoid and minimize constipation. Constipation, it goes hand in hand with urinary symptoms, and we'll kind of talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then practicing pelvic floor strengthening and relaxation. Those, I don't think we hear the last word enough. Uh, we always hear about, oh, do your kegels, get strong, uh, make sure that's how you don't leak or whatever it is. However, we also need to learn what we call in clinic reverse kegels, because if you don't know how to let go, then we also have a problem. Um, and then allowing adequate time to fully empty in the restroom. This is a fun one. I think it relates to all of our postpartum moms, all of our working moms, all of anybody and everybody that's in a rush. Uh, maybe not now because everybody's home because of this quarantine. Or I guess if you have a couple kids home and they're fighting and you need to use the restroom, it's a really difficult time. But again, making sure you spend that extra 30, 45 seconds in the restroom to fully empty your bladder. So it decreases your um, need to go back. Um, some of the don'ts we kind of talked about, um, don't drink water all at once, avoid the ignoring the urge. That's another really big one. Um, depending on the profession, people call it, you know, doctor's bladder, nurse's bladder, whatever it is. 
I guess we can call it PT's letter too, but when you are on a schedule and are not able to use the restroom when nature calls, um, I'm sure we all do that. And at some point where it's just like, need to go, but I think I can wait or need to go, but I have this patient or whatever it is, I just need to get through X amount of time. And X amount of time just kind of turns into too long. When well, we start to do that dance to the restroom, um, avoid just in case voiding. So when we do this, it is when you're kind of like, oh, I'm about to leave the house, let me use the restroom. Or I just went five minutes ago, but I am about to leave the house again, so let me use it again. Um, every time you leave a facility that has a restroom that you're comfortable in, but even if you don't need to use the restroom, you do anyway, the just in case. Um, avoid hovering. This one's a little tough with uh, sanitation purposes, but that is why we have those um, seat covers. But hovering also changes the mechanics of the pelvic floor and how much it's actually working and allowing the bladder to release. So that is also a reason why we kind of try not to hover. Um, and then we talked about rushing and straining. So you're in an urgency. So really quick at the bottom of the list, you'll see normal um, patterns and normal volumes. Normal voiding patterns for the day, this is in a 24 hour day, um, is five to eight times a day. Generally about, mm, if you did break it down, three to four hours. Um, and in the middle of the night, we're probably going zero to one time a night. Um, and the last bullet point that says eight to, sec eight to 10 seconds per void, I think it depends on how fast people count. <laughs> Usually thinking uh, one Mississippi, two Mississippis, but it depends on, it's relative. However, we're looking to empty at least half the bladder. So if you look on the right of the screen, the normal bladder volumes, max capacity is anywhere from 15 to 19 ounces. So I tell people, think about a crystal geyser or an arrowhead water bottle that you buy from the store. That's about 16 ounces. Your bladder can hold that, okay? So normal output, if you look at that second bullet point, is 10 to 15, so roughly-ish half is what we're looking for for normal voiding. Um, Post-void residual is actually what is left in the bladder after we fully empty in a non-rush circumstance. Um, it's less than two ounces. And so that's actually something that the urologist or the doctor can test um, in the clinic if there, that is something that you need to be going in for. Uh, urinary urgency kind of comes on very suddenly. There is a strong, like you can sit here right now, listen to me, and all of a sudden there is a strong urge to use the restroom. And it, there's a couple reasons. We, can talk to, we talked about the bladder irritants. Okay, that can be a really big thing. Um, infections, so UTI, yeast infections. If anybody's ever had them, you know that there's this really strong urge. You go to the restroom and it's maybe a trickle if you're lucky. Um, but also urinary urgency comes on with habits. So if we waited too long and we're used to that and all of a sudden it comes on and it's strong because we've delayed, we've delayed, and we've desensitized ourselves to the delays. And all of a sudden you get to the point where the bladder's really full and it's just kind of like there's no more delaying. So you have that urgency or it's the um, the trucer muscle, your bladder muscle, contracting too soon or too early, causing that increased pressure in the bladder, allowing having that sensation to um, need to use the restroom. So urinary incontinence, um, what is it? So I looked this up with the Mayo Clinic. It's any accidental or involuntary loss of control of the bladder. And when I say loss of control, I don't mean completely. I tell my patients any little drop that you did not want to leave the body, if that ever happened, we're deeming it under that umbrella, okay? so. Um, this little map down here, 33 million people suffer from urinary incontinence in the United States. And it's not just women, it's higher in women, but men also experience it. One in 14 men, um, one in three women. So how many people, oh, I can't see it, sorry. I was gonna take a poll, but depending on how many people we have in here, um, look left, look right on your screen, someone in here probably has it, okay. So looking at that, and a lot of people think, oh, it only happens to geriatric patients, people that are older, blah, 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 blah. It actually is a pretty high percentage in um, women younger than 65, women or men younger than 65. It's, a, again, higher prevalence in um, people that are older. However, it is still prominent. So let's look at common causes of urinary incontinence. Pregnancy and childbirth. Um, very high causes. Vaginal birth versus a C-section, there's a higher, there's a 30% higher increased risk or cause of um, incontinence due to the fact that, like you mentioned, the stretching of um, the vaginal region, all the pressure that has been there. Pregnancy, because of the increased pressure and weight, weakens the pelvic floor. Childbirth, there could be trauma, whether it is an episiotomy, 
a, um, a tear, a prolapse, which is what we'll talk about uh, next week, and some nerve damage and all that that happens down in the pelvic region. Um, menopause is also a common cause, and they think it is more of the change in hormone, the decrease in hormone that makes the urethra a little bit weaker, which um, then leads to a little bit of leakage due to the fact that it can't close everything completely. Surgical procedures, so looking at um, C-sections, hysterectomies, any lower abdominal, pelvic, uh, sometimes even GI type surgeries, because they're cutting through the, that many layers, there may be some nerve damage, there may be some muscle damage. So all of those things play a very integral role in um, how we manage our bladder. Um, in men, enlarged prostates, prostate cancer, those are very big as well, because if you think about a funnel, the prostate is actually at the base of that funnel and acts like a little stopper. So if it's enlarged, then it's constricting on the urethra. If there has been um, any tumors or cancers in that region, again, constriction or um, any type of radiation, chemo, that affects that area as well. Um, neurological disorders, uh, patients who have traumatic brain injury, um, strokes that may involve that region of the spine, um, as well as uh, spinal cord injury. And then bladder irritants, we had talked about it earlier. You know, your common ones are alcohol, caffeine, citrus, spicy um, medications is a really big one as well. Um, so risk factors. So gender is a really big one, as you guys saw in the last slide. Uh, higher um, risk factor for women than men. Um, age is a factor, but it's lower on the list. Just again, as we get older, there is a little bit of weakness. But also looking at the lifestyle we led leading up to it. Um, weight is a big one due to the excess um, pressure that's on the bladder. Smoking, uh, tobacco has a high correlation to urinary incontinence. And then we talk, we'll talk about lifestyle and um, diet. So types of incontinence. There are six types in total, but then I'm, I'm going to show you the common four. So from left to right, you'll see stress incontinence. Stress is more of increased abdominal pressure. So anything we talk about like laughing, coughing, sneezing, um, anything that increases pressure that causes the bladder to kind of have to take up impact. Um, urge incontinence is the involuntary contraction of the bladder. So again, we talked about that coordination piece of bladder and pelvic floor. Overflow incontinence usually happens due to the fact that there's some constriction at the urethra, which means that the bladder is filling normally, but it's getting to capacity and it's running out of space. So generally speaking, um, it could also be a pelvic floor dysfunction where there is not enough relaxation that happens to allow things to come out. Um, and then the last one to the right is the neurogenic incontinence, which is due to a nervous system um, issue or dysfunction. So, I'll, oh, I went over them here. Um, stress urinary incontinence, loss of urine due to increased pressure in the abdominal cavity, uh, physical activity, exertion. So common ones are coughing, laughing, sneezing. Um, I think after getting into this work, it's really funny that when you say like, oh, I laughed so hard, I peed myself. It's a thing. <laughs> so keep in mind. Um, urge urinary incontinence is a sudden irresistible urge to urinate, and you may have some leakage on the way to the bathroom. Or when you're in the bathroom, the pants don't come off fast enough or something of that nature. Um, mixed incontinence is a combination of urge and stress urinary incontinence. Overflow incontinence, like we talked about in the photo prior, it is just a trickle discharge of urine due to the fact that there's increased pressure in the bladder um, due to a restriction of some short, sort. Symptom management for healthy bladder habits. So hydration, 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 hydration. Drinking plenty of water, and I mean flat, boring, clear water, not carbonated, not sweetened, not any of the sort. The, red, the regular one that comes from the geyser. Um, we wanna aim for half your body weight in ounces. So I tell people that's what we do in the clinic because eight ounces for you and I versus eight ounces, I mean, eight glasses for you and I versus eight glasses for Shaquille O'Neal, very different, um, as well as an athlete who runs, you know, the ultras, they're running 100 miles a day versus two versus something else. So those play a really integral role into how much water you should be drinking. Um, physical activity is a really big one. Adequate coordination and strength of pelvic floor. So this is a really big one that we talked about earlier. So contractions are what the kegels are when you squeeze and make sure things don't come out. But then the relaxation piece is very important because things also need to be let out when you are ready for it. Um, so really quick, everybody sitting here, really quick, inhale, exhale, and squeeze your pelvic floor. Can you stop the flow of urine and can you feel that? Or do you feel your butt cheeks working, right? And then when you relax it, 
do you feel it completely open or does it feel like the same kind of sensation? So some things to just kind of think about. Um, lifestyle habits and habits. So avoid pushing and rushing in the restroom when emptying. And also avoiding bladder irritants are two very big ones um, to start with. So next we'll move up to bowel health. So how does the bowel actually work? Um, the, digest the digestive system breaks down and absorbs food and fluids that can be consumed to make nutrients for the body, which kind of gives us the energy to do whatever we want to do. And it actually runs from mouth to anus. So esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, which can also be intermittently used as colon. And then it gets to the rectum and then the, it lets out at the anus. So food, depending on what you ate, how much you ate, and all of those things, it takes anywhere from 12 to 48 hours for food to travel from one end to the other. Um, and normal bowel movements actually vary day to day and person to person. So looking at someone can go three times a day and that is their normal versus every three days and that is their normal. And again, we're just looking for consistency. If you go from every three days to every to three times a day and you haven't done anything different, that may be something to think about or vice versa. If you used to go three times a day or one time a day and you're now going every three days for no specific increased reason as, as such as pregnancy and stuff like that we'll talk about, um, something to probably think about and see if you can change or see the doctor for. So really quick, this is the Bristol stool scale. This helps us um, figure out where everybody is in their bowel movements. So really quick, everybody take a look at the screen and just kind of come up with a number that you most commonly register when you see, uh, when you flush the toilet, okay? So generally speaking, if you look on here, type one to type three-ish is signs of constipation, right? They're hard, they're small, and they're lumpy, okay? Ideal is kind of from here to here. Uh, three and four, where you four is kind of the ideal golden rule of soft and smooth, they're still sausage-like. And then five through seven gets softer as we go, and seven is more liquid-based. So now you see how, why we have this, so people don't have to actually describe it to us. <laughs> um, but thinking about what you eat as well as how hydrated you are puts you on the scale of one through seven and just kind of see what your most common is. So constipation, signs of constipation, um, less than three bowel movements per week. Uh, if you have to really sit there and strain, if you're really pushing and pushing and sweating bullets, uh, lumpy hard stool, if you feel like you're pooping pellets, some people tell me, um, sensation of incomplete emptying. You can sit there, really push, push, and you get a little bit out, and that's about it, but you still feel very bloated and uncomfortable. Okay, that may be a big sign. Um, and well, as well as sensation of blockage or obstruction in that low bowel region. So any increased pain in that lower left region. Lower left corner of the pelvis, I call it the poopy corner. So constipation, that's generally where you're gonna get a lot of um, discomfort if you touch it. So if you're rubbing your belly right now, lower left corner, okay? Just right above the um, hip bone. So give that a rub, see how that feels. And then causes of constipation. So this is not an all-inclusive list, but most of the big ones that we see in clinic, irregular meals, skipping meals, um, not enough fiber, dehydration, uh, types of medication, especially pain meds and stuff like that will cause high um, constipation. Abuse of laxatives. So generally laxatives are used if you've kind of felt constipated and can't go and you wanna to try to loosen up the stool to get a bowel movement. But if it's repetitive use and the body's getting used to the need of an aid, then it will be backed up um, without it. So changes in life routine, um, pregnancy is a really big one, and travel as well as aging. Sometimes um, aging is an interesting correlation just because the metabolism starts to slow as well as the uh, muscle lining start to weaken. So the peristalsis that happens in the intestines slow down a little bit. Uh, also, ignoring urge to have a bowel movement. So having the urge and being like, I can't go, is also another thing. It affects the bladder like we talked about earlier, but it also will affect your bowels. Um, problems with GI function, um, colon or rectum. So if you have IBS, uh, I guess if you don't have IBS, but if you have, um, well, sometimes. Depending on what type of GI issues you have, constipation, constipation may be a cause. Um, and then specific diseases, lack of physical activity. So my big thing for a lot of patients is mobility, is motility. The more you move, the more things move inside you, okay, which kind of bring things into the rectum. So on the flip side, 
On the flip side, you have fecal incontinence. So type one Bristol school scale was more of the hard lumpy ones. This would be our type sevens more so. However, it doesn't necessarily always have to be. So fecal incontinence is the inability to control bowel movements causing stool to leak unexpectedly from the rectum and the anus. Um, common causes, pelvic floor weakness due to any trauma damage or any of that sort. Uh, nerve damage where the sensation is altered and you can't feel pressure or the need to use the restroom. Um, chronic constipation is also a really big one because if you are very backed up or have um, obstructive, obstruction in the bowel, then things are still moving, gravity is still working, but you might get something that comes out that you don't necessarily know. Um, diarrhea, if stool is on the wetter side, fluid is harder to control and close off. Um, so there's that. Hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids are internal or external, but when they're active and flared, they cause um, these little pockets that, are, that don't allow the anus to completely close. So when that happens, then you may or may not have a little bit of leakage in that. Um, loss of capacity in the rectum. So again, if there is any surgical procedure that someone had to have um, part of their rectum removed or something of that nature, then you'll get um, a little bit of leakage from there. So risk factors, again, age, gender, nerve damage. So neuropathy with um, patients who have multiple sclerosis or diabetes mellitus, again, um, the sensation change is big. Dementia is a really big one due to the fact that the person is not aware that they need to use the restroom or they forget. That's a really big one. Um, and physical disability. So unable to get to the restroom in a timely manner because of a functional limitation. Okay, symptom management for healthy bowels. Kind of runs on the same list of um, bladder. So looking at hydration, making sure you drink plenty of water. Um, nutritious diet, so whole foods, adequate amount of fiber. Fiber is a really big one. Generally speaking, we're recommending 20 to 35 grams a day. That depends on the person. Uh, you also don't want to overdo the fiber because that could back you up. Um, eating meals regularly. So again, the body's really good at survival mode. If it doesn't get food in, it just kind of hoards it because it doesn't know when the next supply is coming. So making sure you're eating regularly and you're eating roughly around the same times. Um, and chewing thoroughly. So don't scarf down your food and walk away. So making sure you chew and you're able to break it down and help with digestion to be more efficient. Um, physical activity for motility and coordination of pelvic floor. So looking at, again, right, if you have an urge and I need to walk from here to the restroom, my pelvic floor has to squeeze to not let anything out. But also when I do sit down, making sure that I'm able to relax enough to allow the sphincter to open and allow the contents to escape and as well as lifestyle and habits. So sitting posture. Uh, a lot of people talk about the, city, uh, the squatty potties. If you don't have a squatty potty, I tell people grab a yellow blue book, a yellow book. I guess they don't have those anymore. Um, shoe boxes, shoe boxes are great. So making sure you stack them up and just make sure your knees are higher than your hips. It just changes the angle of the rectum and allows easier um, bowel movements. And avoid straining and pushing. Again, you shouldn't need to be sitting there to really, really push and strain and hold your breath and turn purple. If that is the case, that is something we can talk about. Um, that is all I have for you.